And finally, we move to open orphan. And I'm sure we'll find out exactly what a, an orphan is uh, in this uh, context. Uh, this uh, hopes to become a European rare disease and orphan drug uh, fo focus uh, services company. And uh, all masterminded by, uh, I think, uh, reasonable say, a noted Donegal uh, corporate financier. Uh, he organized a reverse takeover of uh, the clinical trials at group Venn Life Sciences. And, uh, well, we often talk about oil and gas on these evenings. And in fact, uh, uh, he was involved in the floating of uh, Fastnet. Indeed, he did float Fastnet oil and gas. Obviously, a company may be familiar to some of you and the drug group uh, Amrit Pharma. So, Cathal Friel. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking your time. I'm conscious and um, last speaker. We want to get some nice, this beautiful room of beer and, and get some alcohol. So I'll try and make a reasonably swift 15, 20 minutes to allow some time for Q and A. But as Nigel said, look, this is very much an opportunist. This is not a lifetime role. This is not five years role. My wife tells me I have a um, tension span of a gnat. This is a, a year or two roll of the dice, this business. What we're trying to do with this business, uh, and this is again like my background is corporate finance, corporate financer, I, first IPO I did was I was involved with Cove Energy, went through the roof, but unfortunately it was only a very bit player. Then we did fast at oil and gas, it worked, oil price collapsed, and we reversed it and created Amrit Pharmaceutical. It's been much more successful. Amrit, you might watch in the market in the next coming weeks, as public is going from 60 million market cap to 300 million share price knocking up to absorb in a very large American company with 150 million revenues. So that's de-risking Amrit, and I remain one of the larger shareholders in Amrit. Uh, I was thinking of selling the shares a year ago, because a year ago, because they were waiting on a trial, waiting on a trial, but now they've de-risked it, they've acquired serious revenues. And that's what came an idea, and this is an idea, it's pure opportunist. And then he's thinking of investing in this particular company, what I'd suggest is that you've got to look at the three individuals behind it and are they worth backing? And I'll take you to them, myself, my two colleagues. But really what we're trying to do is that, look, I'm not a pharma expert. I got lucky in Amrit. I found two brilliant guys, Joe Wiley and Roy Nealon. They're the pharma people. They knew what they were doing. And I let them get on and I keep saying, make us rich, guys. But what always frightened me with my stockbroken hat on pharmaceuticals, and we had a couple of them in Ireland, the Elan, it was up down, up, down. If you pick the cycle, you can make lots of money. But if you picked your price wrong, it could double, triple, or it could half. But there was a bunch of pharmaceutical companies, the services companies, that grew at 25% compound. And in particular, my fellow founder, Brenton Buckley, a youthful 67-year-old, he's been involved the last seven years in Icon. He sold a small company to Icon um, in 2013. Icon's market cap was 800 million. Six years later, when he left to join us, it had gone 10x up. Icon never took a risk in his life. It runs clinical trials. It provides services to pharmaceutical companies, makes a shed load of money, and compound growth. And that's where we came up with this idea. We put together a pharmaceutical services company. Everything should be cost plus profitable. And being honest, it's opportunity, and we've tagged on let's do orphan drugs, it's kind of sexy. Uh, there's nobody else specializing in orphan drugs. We're not exclusively orphan drugs. First of all, what's an orphan drug? Four years ago, I was going, hmm, something to do to feed orphans, is it? I'm not sure, didn't know, be honest with you. Now we'll talk about them. Orphan drugs is basically a name for diseases that are very rare. So uh, the treatment that treats a rare disease is called an orphan because there's not a lot of them around. A bit like orphan children, there's not an awful lot around. So orphan drugs, our drugs for diseases are quite rare. However, they're not as rare as one might imagine. I'll come to that. Very quickly, look, if you're going to invest in the company, this is an opportunist play. Myself, I think I've talked enough. I've done three IPOs. One of the more successful now is the third one. Um, background corporate finance, stockbroken. Um, mainly was involved in selling companies for 15 years. And those last seven years trying to promote companies put together. Only difference I generally make compared to maybe some of the other small cap companies is that I generally, to get it, I end up with a decent stake. And Amrit, when we IPO'd, I was the second largest shareholder. I'm in the third largest shareholder. Open or from it, become the biggest shareholder. And the only way you can do that is write a check. My wife kills me. I don't have many minions, might have only one or two, but it usually all goes in. I put a million, almost two million now, into Open Orphan to get it away. I did the same with Amrit. As that means, if it goes wrong, I get hurt quite badly, equally as badly as you. So I just think, and at the IPO, 
the mistake I made in the Amrit IPO in the fast that I had a lot of money, a million in them. But the fund manager said, hey, Carl, mm, smart boy, how much money have you in the IPO? I said, they are at our IPO price. So this one, I put 300,000 of my own cash in at 5.6p in IPO eight weeks ago. So that means the fund managers, and we went to the fund managers in this one, said, oh, okay, you're in alongside us at the same price. So look, enough about me. The two people who really know what they're doing are my colleague, Morris. Uh, yeah, there we are. Um, and he, what he's really bringing, he's chief commercial officer. We're doing we're purely services cost plus, so we're not going to get 5x uplift. We're going to try and grow 25 or 30% compound growth. But we're going to sex it up, to use Tony Blair's comment. And how are we going to sex it up? We're bringing the digital platforms, and particularly this genomic database business. Morris, four years ago, put this company together. Unfortunately, he wasn't really a shareholder. He was a venture partner for a large life science fund. Established Genomic Medicine Ireland, GMI. Picked up very quickly 15% of the DNA of the Irish population. Not very hard, Ireland's. The entire population, people forget in Ireland, is less than greater than Manchester. Irish people make a lot of noise and claim to be much bigger than that. When you think of it, this little noisy island over on the west coast is smaller population based than greater Manchester. So however, Morris put that together with some colleagues, did a funding round in year three for 400 million and sold it to the Wishy Next Code. So you can imagine, now unfortunately, Morris made that money. He was acting for a biotech venture fund, but it was fabulously successful. So Morris is coming in, he's bringing the, the DNA database business being on, he's sexing up our services businesses. And Brendan, youthful 67-year-old, done a couple of exits, sold his last company to Icon, and he said he made more money on the rising share price in Icon, the 10X that he did from selling his company on day one, where he worked for seven years. Um, 30 years in clinical trials, claimed the fame, he wrote a book, How to Speed Up Clinical Trials and Fix Them, and his real one, he's very involved with the European Medicines Agency and a colleague here in Oxford, they co-authored the European orphan drug protocols. So he knows his way around the orphan drug space. Moving swiftly on, uh, pharma consulting. Why are we chasing the consulting space? Why are we not developing drugs? The pharma consulting business, it's high margins, but it's highly fragmented. There's about 10, 15 monsters, Icon being one of them, 8 billion market cap, hundreds, even thousands of small players. It's rapid growth. Compound 8.8% growth. The pharma consultant space in America alone is 8.9. And then why are we talking about orphan drugs? The reason is interesting. 20 years ago, there was no orphan drugs. Pharma companies were after the asthma, the heart disease, the cancer. And then they've slowed off, and there was no cures for these rare diseases, i.e. the orphan drugs. And they changed the rules, making them quicker, faster. And then suddenly, there's now today, 20 years ago, there was hardly a single orphan drug approved anywhere in the world. Today. 2,500 orphan drugs in the FDA pipeline. And up here, 58% of all drugs approved last year by the FDA were orphan drugs. It's a pretty good space to be. A little quick bit in orphan drugs, why are they? Basically, oops, like, if you get approval, you've guaranteed seven years exclusivity in the USA, guaranteed 10. You can charge, this is a bit naughty, you can charge four and a half times, or on average, they're four and a half times more expensive. You get a big, a uh, priority review voucher that can be sold for up to 300 million if you get approved. Trials are tiny, 65% smaller. And the real one is Americans are ahead of us. Uh, there's 520 orphan drugs, FDA approved in America today. They can be brought simply to Europe. No clinical trials, just need some approval process. There's only 180 in Europe. So that's kind of what you see. Ooh, it's an interesting space. Very quickly, don't want to be keeping these too late. Um, this is, look, what we're doing. We're putting together a high margin pharma services company and adding two digital offerings. This is the virtual rep and the genomic database. But what we've got over here, open orphan, purely opportunist, left the board of Amrit. The guys are doing a fantastic job. They were developing the drugs. I knew nothing about how to run clinical trials. I don't get in the way. Some people say they kicked me off the board. Some people I'd say left the board. A joke can answer that, but I left as second biggest shareholder, sold very few shares. I think they're doing a great job, but they have de risk it. That's Arm Amrit. I thought I'd take the knowledge that they taught me, I knew damn well of it, and set this up. And we put Open Orphan, small services company providing services. We acquired Venn, it's a struggling life science company on AIM. It did 14 and a half million last year, it did 16 million the year before, 18, never made money. It actually, you have to work hard at losing money, not making money in the pharma services business. They did it. 
We bought them very cheap. I'll show you how we did it very quickly. It was undercapitalized, never really raised proper money, struggled. Um, we paid four million for it. Uh, market cap was, the share price is 1.2p, market cap a million when I got involved last Christmas. Tried to fix it, didn't get there. Suspended the share price in May, when it was two million. We increased the four, uh, which is the price of 2.4p, raised four and a half million on the 28th of June and relisted it at 5.6. The goal was recapitalize it, restructure it, make it profitable, and this is the one. And this is any of you looking to get involved in this company, and this is the, the real bad if We can't do this, do not invest in Open Orphan. We have to try and get it re rated. Open Orphan has now, last year, run rate 14.5 million revenues. Most of our peer group in this high margin consulting trades at two to three times sales. We're currently trading about one. We are fixed, and Van is still not fixed. We're working over the next weeks and months to try and knock it in shape, stop the losses. But our belief is at 14.5 million sales, we should be, we're currently about that 14 or 15 million market cap. So we're trading at one time sales at the moment. And even put, so our belief is we should, our market cap should at least double. Is that going to be three months, six months, 12 months? And then the bigger piece, we're going to launch these additional services, basically Orphan Drug, the digital platform, two of them, the virtual rep, and more importantly, the genomics database. Interesting thing about uh, Van, look at the bloody, excuse me, look at the customers they have. Janssen, which is part of Johnson & Johnson, Prometeor, Boring Ingler, huge German, GMAP, Servia, huge French, Galapagos, farming, very large Dutch, all very large European pharma companies. We had to try and acquire them slowly, we kill it. So we acquired a company with loads of customers, good revenues. And what we now do is try, try we say, and cross sell some of our digital services to those companies. We're also, to grow any more than 20 or 30% would kill us organically. And if you run your own business to grow more than 20 or 30%, it is difficult. So we set a target. We're going to bolt on one or two more companies with decent revenues. We set ourselves a target of adding 30 million in high margin revenues within the next year or two. They don't have to be orphan. It's just consultancy services. We'll have the, because we've got the orphan framework around it. So add revenue, increase the margin, and then people, we, we're trying to acquire these companies at one time sales. And ultimately, we're trying to then get ourselves re rated because all our competitors, small, listed, and private pharma consulting companies, trade at two times revenues or three. Standalone little ones, you can get them for one. So it's a valuation arbitrage. And that's, there's no rocket science. We bolt a couple of these together, we take out the back office costs, and then we try and sex them up with the two digital platforms. And that's what we're saying. We're combining high margin pharma services, no risk. It's not going to get up 5x, but at least it's hopefully not going to half. And add on the digital offerings. What are the two digital offerings very quickly? The first one, and this slide comes up a few times, the virtual rep, is basically some pharma companies are doing this, but traditionally pharmaceutical companies, like the oil and gas companies and like the tobacco companies, they make a lot of cash. If you make a lot of cash, you're not killing yourself to innovate. You're not bringing in change. So we've got a digital platform where we have basically the contact is of 4,000 physicians across Europe who prescribe orphan drugs. And we have a little call center in Dublin. We connect them with pharmaceutical companies and charge a lot of money. And we basically send out a pack, send an email, but this is what we set up a conference call, a webinar with the consultant doctor and a pharmaceutical company, and we do the handover. And we charge them a lot of money for that. That's the virtual rep. We cut the sales rep out, and then the pharmaceutical company has a direct contact to the physician, and off they go. We never touch the drug. Most other industries do this every day of the week. Pharmaceutical companies, this is kind of new to them, strangely. The second piece of the sexing up of the services, and what we're trying to do, what we say sexing up, and Tony Berger murdered for that word, is that but basically pharma consulting is kind of boring, high margin, you can't double or triple. But if we add a few more to them, we can grow much faster. And we just add the digital platforms. This platform is particularly exciting, uh, the genomics database platform. Traditionally, and what my learning three, four years ago with Joe Wiley and Rory and Amrit, they were saying, look, we've got to own the drugs. We've got to own the drugs, a bit like our colleagues earlier. But 
most drugs, so many drugs, not all drugs, have a gene therapy application and look at them. So the genomic, you want to see what's, what's the genomics. So our belief now, if we can own this database of genomic data, it's not quite as valuable, but it's getting as valuable. If you own the data that helps pharmaceutical companies make drugs, that's got an intrinsic value. And some of us would say, that's more valuable than owning a drug. So how are we doing that database? Basically, our colleague Morris Tracy did this previously GMI. They went off and harvested the data, created it, did the gene sequences. Instead, GDPR in Europe, pain in the ass for anybody who got a business. However, everybody in the room tonight can go home and write a letter to your dentist tomorrow and say, dear dentist, under GDPR rules, I would like a copy of my dental records, my x-rays, because I gather you've got them on digital. Your dentist has 30 days and he has to send you a copy of your patient data. It's a pain in the ass for him. If he doesn't, after 30 days, you write again, dear dentist, you have 30 more days. Otherwise, I report to the data commission and you're out of business. So what we're doing here is rare disease patients across Europe have lots of genomic data because the kids are sick. The parents are trying to find out what's wrong with them. They do loads of genetic. So a lot of rare disease patients have this data. It's sitting in the hospital. They don't know. Under GDPR rules, those kids own that data, not the hospital. And all we're doing here, we will never sell the data, we'll never broker it, never leave it. We just host it. We tell the patient advocacy groups who are charities, tell your patients, send your data, use our paperwork to our server. We will never let it leave our server. We will host it, corral it. We allow pharmaceutical companies to examine it, and we charge them a lot of money. They can never take the data. They can play around with the genome, do the full analysis, and we'll split the revenue share with the patient advocacy group. So we've now got 400 sales reps across Europe called patient advocacy groups. They're saying, wow, these guys can do a revenue share and they'll speed up development. And the big part is DNA at the moment, your genome is like your fingerprint. People have been given away and say, oh, there's only one fingerprint in the world like that. I really shouldn't give it away. So what we're trying to do is we're never letting the data leave our server. If the patient or the kid, I want my data back, one click, data goes back, delete, it never leaves the server. I think that's the critical part. Morris's last company made a lot of mistakes. It sold for about 500 million, but they got caught up in GDPR. So this one's been built. GDPR is our friend. If it was general population, most people say, oh, I couldn't be bothered to send my data. But if it's rare disease, they're sick kids, the parents are very motivated, here, take our data, have a look at it, try and find it. So that's, it's, it, it's quite simple. Anybody can copy this, but there's nobody copying at the moment. And bear in mind what I said, we're just pulling this together very quickly taking a couple of services, company already have got two, put them together, add this to it, and the plan would be we would hope and expect. You either get consolidated, you consolidate, or you get consolidated out, and this is the piece that makes us very interesting for somebody wanting to buy something of more substance. We believe this will ensure open orphan disappears within 18 months. You know where that goes, it's not disappearing in deeper, it gets bought, basically. Very quickly, digital health data, the platforms are currently one of the hottest, you hear loads of them. And all we're doing, this entire platform costs us one million to develop. I paid most of the money to develop it because we just put it together. We copied Morris's old one. We're not paying for the data. And we've just put it, it's one of the simplest business models I ever saw. And that's it. There's loads more of them. Conscious of time, I don't want to dwell. So that's that. Healthcare data, rare disease patients' data, the pharmaceutical will pay lots of money, there's loads of stats on it. So, we believe all we need is 10,000 patient records, and there's 30 million rare disease patients in Europe. So we need 10,000 scattered across Europe. We have a bunch of pharmaceutical companies who said, get 500 patients in your database, we'll start paying you money. In summary, we would say this, wouldn't we? We're a compelling investment case. But basically, the management team own over 30% of the company. I personally put in 2 million of the company, 300,000 of it has gone into the IPO. We're all locked up for three years, and we're hoping to hell with the company sold long before that. Um, the three of us, and if anybody's interested, you need to look at the three of us. Uh, there are no chickens, I'm 54, Morris is 56, and Brenton 67, so we've, we kinda, if we made massive money in our previous one, maybe Joe and Rory might make us all rich in Amrit, or we'd give it up, but we haven't, but this is, we believe, our roll of the dice now to make a substantial amount of cash for ourselves, and more importantly, for our investors. So we basically were saying, we have a track record of building successful companies. None of them successful enough that I wouldn't be standing up here trying to do another company. Uh, we're fast, we're targeting the orphan drug because it's fast growing, it's sexy, it's interesting. 
and we've branded the company Open Orphan, opening European markets for orphan drugs. It's designed to be attractive from day one. That big pharma say, oh, that ticks a lot of our boxes. It has a clear four-pronged strategy. It's basically services, bolt on then, do the digital platform, do the genomic database. We're just basically rolling these out to our existing customers. And finally, we're looking to generate very much focused on shareholder returns, revenues, profits, rising share price. And I say we got the share price, we IPO'd at 5.6 in June. We got a bit overactive in July, it ran up to 8.4, 40, 50% uplift. We got our head down quietly in August to try and get with it. I'm back, you can see a lot of, I'm doing a lot of in retail client engagement in the next three or four months. And one thing we're saying, we are not raising money, and that's not typical, ramp the share price up and then raise money. We raised enough money. We're doing acquisitions. So around the turn of the year, we're doing an acquisition. We're not paying cash, we're paying paper. So the stronger our share price is, the less equity we give away. And that's why I did two tonight, and doing another one tomorrow night. We want to just generate value in our share price, and that's our blood going forward. We'll use our equity to acquire one or two acquisitions, and it's game on at that. Uh, we're also putting our money where our mouth is. We're saying we will have a dividend within two years if we're generating cash, making profits, and we're not reinvesting. All the investment's done, the two databases are built, so we want to pay a dividend. And we've been very careful how we say this, but there's a clearly defined EGVIS strategy post-phase, post-scale-up. We have a good few staff that don't like hearing, oh, Carl, you're buying us, now you're selling us, what are you doing, the customers? So we say, live with your own imagination, what's going to happen if I have a attention span of a gnat? Within 12 or 18 months, I certainly don't want to be driving this or like either somebody else like a Joe and Rory doing it and bringing the three or four hundred million or to be gone. Would any further ado hand over maybe to questions? Uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed. That's Kafel with a disarmingly direct approach to uh, how he's going about building the company. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. One rush at the front. Just give us a bit more flavour about these acquisitions at one time's earnings. What's the motivation of the seller? Is there an earn out? Are they important to the business? Or can you just strip everything out apart from the product? Yeah, Keith, good question. First of all, we're not paying cash. What happens if you pay cash to somebody? They walk out the door and you never see them again. You end up carrying the baby. We're paying stock. And that's why we started to engage with the market. We want to generate drive our share price up in the next three or four months. We're paying equity, and it's a very simple form. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of these small consultings over here. It's very easy to get to three, four, five million pharma revenues as a one-man show with 10 staff. Getting to 10 million is really difficult. Getting 20 million is impossible. So we can pick them up for about one times revenue. When you're slightly bigger, where we claim we are, 15, 20 million revenues, we're rated at two to three times revenue. So that's the rewritten. So we can actually say, look, we'll give you one times revenue. You get it over three or four years. You have a small amount of equity up front, and it is equity, not cash. After 12 months, you get another strip of equity. After 24 months, more equity. And after 36. And each time, those equity strips are locked up for 24 months. And we would hope after 24, 36 months, the company's going to hire better things. So, and there's a lot of them. So really, their valuation arbitrage on their own, they're not particularly attractive. There's nobody looking for them. If we can put a bunch of them together, and the target is to get to 40 million revenues, then we're kind of interesting. We're still microscopic, but we get 40 or 50 million revenue, which isn't hard, two acquisitions. Like, the, we've guided the market, we are doing something, all going well around Christmas. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thanks. Uh, yes, one here. Um, I guess a question to all of you, just to address the elephant in the room a bit. We've heard from some quite smart, very smart people this evening. And, but Martin's point, one in a one in hundred of these companies is successful. Um, clearly quite a speculative thing to invest in any, any one of these, although they all may be good prospects. Uh, is there a way to de-risk that investment store, or pool it, or you know, rather than put a little bit in all these companies and hope they get a thousand times growth or something, is there a way to buy a fund of all these sorts of companies or any other ways you suggest, so it's not such a risky proposition for, for a retail investor. We better not start with capital. Let's ask uh, Martin that. Um, yes, is the answer. Um, we don't have uh, investment trusts in quite the same way, but there are quoted companies 
for example, IP Group, uh, Arix Biosciences, uh, BB Biotech. So there are, there are a few um, funds that you can go for where the risk is clearly much broader. So you, I mean, just ask the other two briefly. I mean, are you happy to work with those companies? Because obviously they can be pretty brutal as to whether they'll support you or not. Well, yeah, I mean, they invest, uh, IP Group invest in startups, privates, some take them public. Um, we've never had, had their investment. In years gone by, I had some of Novartis VC money, but of course, yeah, I think when you're in a, especially in the startup phase of a biotech, uh, you, you, uh, you hunt for money, and IP Group would uh, mm. be like Woodford, of course, as well, historically, which is. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a draw. Yeah, you know, just fail over that. Well, yeah, everyone's been very negative, but there's a huge amount of money has gone to work, and it maybe it delivers drugs for some of it. So mm. if you're um, you know, not with an orphan yeah. disease and one of the Woodford companies saves your child, then you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps you won't Absolutely, be negative. Yes. So I think the. Uh, Tim, you want to add anything there? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd say the same. I mean, if you're trying to raise money, um, as certainly I've done at Optra by Medica many times over, you'll take the money from where you can get it, uh, provided that that investor doesn't perhaps have too big a, a, a chunk and, and therefore they've got their claws. I think one of the problems with Woodford is he did take some very, very big stakes in companies, 30, 40 percent, and now you know those companies have got a problem. Yes. Because, so I, I think if you're desperate, you, you perhaps you, you get that situation on. But if you can, if you can take um, uh, somebody's money and, and that they've got one or two percent, it's it's not yeah. really a problem for, for you as long as you've got the cash in the bank. Okay, we're almost at the end of our time. Can take one more question from the floor. Anybody else? Uh, at the front here. Thank you, Open Orphan. Um, very interesting idea. You don't have clinical risk. You you your service business. Um, volume driven efficiency and and clearly some very interesting digital data proposals. So what, what are the risks for, for open orphan? Because clearly it's not clinical. The right. other guys have it's like the, it's been, like the interview been, question, been running it? around for many years. They still need to raise money. They still need to prove their products. You raise money and you're running and you don't need to hopefully raise anytime soon. Yeah, simple answer to that. You're investing myself personally, Brendan and Morris. We have over a half net worth tied up in it. I think the answer was very valid. A year ago, I had over half, I think, over half my net worth tied up in Amrit. I kept thinking, I just tossed a coin. Amrit is a fabulous company. Phase three readout. If it's success, it would double. If it's failure. But how they mitigate the risk, they went off and did a huge transaction. They bought a company with 150 million in sales and it was kind of roll the dice. Uh, in ours, look, basically, it's purely opportunist. I just thought an Amrit was too high risk. 50, 50. Can you be opportunists with four different legs? Well, so no, we should say four. It's not really. It yes. should, it's really. Look, it's, it's one leg. We're picking up a number of services company that's been rebranded. Never mind the bronze. It's roll up a couple of services companies and add on the virtual sales rep as an offering, and have the general database. And we'll be very honest. That's sexing the services company up. Se services companies are not sexy, but the good part is. It's very hard to half the sales if you've done 14 million last year. It's very hard to do seven. You really have to work at that. We've got 100 different clients. So I think, look, to answer the question about it, that, look, we're, we're hoping to grow substantially in the next six or 12 months. A few acquisitions. Will we half in price? Hopefully not. Will we dub? Double, hopefully we will. But we won't go up 5x. The beauty about people want to invest in any of these, if you get an FDA approval, there's 5x. So I think to answer the other question here, if I was an investor, you put it in safe shares, and then you allocate some to oil and gas and some to the biotech, and the way you avoid getting blown up is a little strip across a few of them. But if you think about it, a biotech can give you 5x. We won't give you 5x. We might double your money or more, but we hopefully won't half it. But if you're going to try and get five times your money, you have to be honest to yourself. I think that's where Woodford went wrong. Like a big thing was Woodford. Where did Woodford make all his money in his original high income fund? Cigarettes. They paid a guaranteed dividend for 20 years of 6% and they grew at 6%. And when he went wrong, and that's where he was involved in the broker, when he went wrong, he straight into, he then he went to GSK and Pfizer, 6% dividend and grew at 6%. He, wow, this is really easy. And being honest, I just think we would forget greedy. Um, he then strayed away from the high income, no, cigarettes, it's like it threw off tons of cash, big dividend, GSK, Pfizer. And then when their dividend tailed off some years ago, he said, oh, I'm a genius, whatever. And I'll go into biotech where there's no revenue, no dividend, and he was looking for the 5X. And I think that's where dividend went 
report. I think he was a genius when he stuck to high income stock tracking. And really, we're, we're providing the picks and shovels to all these types of companies. He went into the, the coal face. Okay, well, Kathy Frill, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, we've uh, heard a terrific range of ideas. Obviously, none of these are, uh, uh, don't treat them as investment advice. Clearly, you need to make uh, your own decisions, do your own research. But it's been brilliant to hear from uh, all these guys tonight. So, thank you very much indeed, all of you, for uh, being with us. I just mentioned our next investment event, which is oil and gas. Uh, an old favourite uh, for uh, LSE uh, users, and uh, we think we'll have uh, Echo Atlantic uh, will be one of the companies uh, which has been very much uh, of interest in the news at the moment. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Please join us for refreshments. That event, by the way, on November the 12th, so maybe see you again. Thank you very much indeed.